All right, hello and welcome evening to everybody. Can everybody hear and see me okay? Yes. Good, Pastor. All right, All right. thank you, ma'am. Okay, good. We're getting several yeses <clears throat> in the free conference call side, and if you can let me know if we're good over on YouTube, Craig, we you, you everything good on your end, sir? All right, fantastic. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We'll have an officer that can give us an opening prayer, and then we'll we'll get things cranked up. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, it's again that you have allowed us to come back out to uh, study your word in a, another Bible class. Lord, I thank you for giving us this opportunity to, to learn more and more about what you want for us to do in our lives. And I ask you for your guidance and your direction. Lord, I ask you please go with our pastor and the first lady. And Lord, please go with each and every one of our family. I thank you for what you're doing and what you're about to do for Christ's sake and name. Amen. Thank you, sir. And once again, welcome to everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to everybody. Uh, glad to have you all here. Uh, I'm going to ask for general updates and announcements in a moment, but I want to recognize Elder Jones. I thank him for giving our prayer, and we thank God for him in general. He's 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 uh he's had a a couple of trial weeks, but he is yes still here and, and praying and doing the work of the Lord. And I just thank God for you, sir. I really do. And y'all just show him some love in the chat. Anything you want to say? No, I just thank him to the Lord that made me to be on. Amen. Good deal. Thank you, sir. All right. Anything going on? Anybody want to share or talk about? We've been away for almost a whole month now, if not a month. I have lost track of when we were here. But anything going on? Anybody want to share or talk about? Get up to speed on? Have you enjoyed your time off? Glad he kept you. That's what Misha was saying. Yeah. All right. Y'all talk to me. Y'all, y'all, y'all glad to be back? You mad? You upset? What y'all talk to me? Somebody talk to me. What's going on? Well, I'm glad to be back. I've been gone for a while. So I'm glad to be back. Settle down and relax. Get back into things. Good, good deal. Thank you, ma'am. And I got, got a couple of, got, uh, Raise hands up from, from Trey and Asia. Thank you, guys. Well, hopefully everybody's done well. You know, I've been busy with the uh, Presbyterian General Assembly. All those things went well. Just busy. Just busy. I do still want us to still be mindful of uh, some. We have several families that have, have suffered bereavement over the last uh, couple of weeks, really, it, it really last week or so. Um, God, yet still good. He's blessing. He's keeping. I've been blessed to, to be around. Some faith-filled people, you know, we, we can't ignore, we're going to talk about it some tonight, we can't ignore or predict the challenges of life that we go through and that we come across, uh, but it is such a comfort to know that we have the peace and the presence of God in those difficult moments, and hopefully that we're learning and understanding that we have a, a wonderful church family of, of uh, men and women and, and of all ages that love us, that love the Lord, and that we can shoulder these loads and these burdens together. So I pray that's what I'm seeing and experiencing, and I pray that's the same for all of you. Okay? All right. Well, we um, we had been studying on uh, pace, talking about the fast pace of this world and and our lives and all that's going on and trying to mimic uh, the pace of Jesus and learn from him how to better balance all the things that's going on in our lives and uh, all the things that's going on in this world. You know, we're getting ready to start back in school and somewhat it will be back into a normal routine for many of us uh, and different things of that nature. But hopefully we're learning and uh, teaching ourselves how to balance how to adjust, how to juggle, when to slow down, when to speed up, and when to move at the pace the Lord has set forth. So, um, trying to get my screen share going. Y'all let me know when, if and when, if you can see the screen. Can y'all see the screen okay? Okay. 
Can y'all see the screen okay? Yes, sir. Let me, okay. All right, good deal. All right. Um, so what have we learned? Just, just, just real quick. What's one thing? Just give me one thing you've learned so far about this, what we've been talking about, if you can remember. We need to re refresh our memory a little bit. What's one thing that has stood out to you from what we've studied and learned so far about uh, this fast pace and stuff? Anybody? Anybody. Anybody. Type it in or Anybody. you can talk to Anybody. it. All right. Sometimes if that happens, that means you're probably listening on multiple devices and they're close to each other. So mute at least one of them if you want to talk so that we don't get that feedback. All right. Anybody? Uh, Asia said, unless God builds the house, all the other work is pointless. Amen. That's that Psalm 127 text. Very good. Marissa said, we need to be need God to be our pace setter. Very good. I was going to ask about that. that he is our pace setter, meaning he sets and dictates the pace in which we should move and helps us know when to speed up, when to slow down, all those different things. And Asia said, also, it will fall apart if it's not built by God. Amen. That's what that text taught us. And I'm glad our young people are grabbing hold to that and, and uh, was able to reference that. Elder Michael said, a hurried life feeds a hurried life feeds a need for approval. Amen. We're gonna talk. I think that's coming up. If we haven't talked about it already, that's definitely coming up. God can have a blessing in a confused state, and okay, I'm done. No, you ain't done. You're doing good. Keep sharing. Oh, that's what I want. This that's what this needs to be. We all need to have nuggets need to have impressionable thoughts that we can begin to reframe and retrain our mind and our life off of these things. And we learn and we grow more the more we share. So you don't have to be done. This is open for everybody. All right, anybody else? Jesus is never rushed. No, he's not. He is never rushed. Anybody else? All right, so it looked like we're pick, picking up on some of these things. Uh, Ruby said we have to be still and wait. Amen. Being still and waiting is an action. It's an action. It's a demonstration of faith uh, because it takes faith to wait on the presence and the power and the timing of the Lord when you know there's a need that needs to be taken care of now. So you waiting, you standing still signifies to him, Lord, I trust you with the timing aspect that you set forth the appropriate pace and that things will work in the way that they need to for the good of this situation. Very good. Like that. Anybody else? Make sure I didn't miss anything on YouTube. Okay. All As right. So, hope. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. As you mentioned that um, a hurried life can destroy the relationship with God. I don't know if we mentioned that, but we need to mention that. A hurried life can damage and, and uh, affect the relationship with God. Very good. And that goes along with that being still and learning through your stillness, you learn how to better discern the presence and the voice of God, and it improves the relationship. Okay, good deal. Anybody else? All right, so we've learned these things, and prayerfully we will learn even more. And like I said, it's important to not just learn them in passing, but to hopefully begin to adapt new habits, uh, new actions oops, that will help us to be able to improve upon some of the things that's going on in our life. Did we talk about, typically speaking, how many days it takes to develop a form of new habit or to break an old one? Have we ever discussed that in this call? Yeah, 21 days. 21 days. 21 days is typically, uh, okay, yeah. 21 days is typically the time frame that's allotted for you to either to form new habits or to sometimes break old ones. So you have to kind of discipline yourself, uh, put focused intention upon certain things so that you can retrain the way you think about it, the way you look at it, and the way you end up doing things. And then before you know it, it becomes second nature. Okay. Any questions or comments or anything before we pick back up? Um, I know we talked about the cancel culture. Did we finish up that discussion? Yes, sir. I think we did. Okay. All right. I tell you what. Let's just start and make sure that we cover everything that we need. Let's. Um, 
I know we did talk about the family and membership. So let's start here where it says Jesus never catered to the crowds. Now let's let's pick up there. Somebody pick up and read there for us, please. Jesus never catered to the crowds. He often retreated from crowds to be alone. He gave us his he, he gave his most controversial sermons when the largest crowds gathered around him. In fact, on one occasion in John 6, Jesus said something so controversial that many of his disciples left and never followed him again. All right, I want to talk about this one in a little bit, so you can you can start turning to your Bibles to that text, and, and we'll talk about it in a moment. That's uh, John, the sixth chapter, and there's several verses here, and I can't remember how many I wanted to read, but we'll look at it. But let's talk about this a minute. We know Jesus, let, let's imagine him at this particular moment when this is being discussed about him. He's not in a glorified state. He's not... Um, necessarily this big shot person completely. He is in a way because he's done a lot of great things. Word is spreading about his ministry and the things that he's doing around for people. But then it comes time for him to either to speak, but to either do so in a way that's convenient for what people want to hear or what God would have him to say. Now, if I were talking to a bunch of preachers, and it, it would apply even to you, many of you that are in ministry in general, but if I was talking to a bunch of preachers, I would ask the question, have you ever had a moment where you had to say something that you didn't want to say? And I don't really think you can preach effectively the way God wants you to preach if you haven't had a moment where you've had to say some things <laughs> that you didn't necessarily want to say. That's one of the most difficult things in the world because no matter who you are, what you do for the Lord, there's just something inside of our DNA that makes us want to be, not necessarily have people approve of us, but you don't want to necessarily, well, most people don't want to be at odds with folks. And so you have to assess, there will be times when you're doing the work of the Lord. It doesn't have to be preaching. That's just the easiest example to use. But there will be times where you have to make a decision upon the stand that you want to make, the words that you speak, the actions that you take. Is this going to make me more popular to people, or is this something that would be more pleasing to God? Has anybody had that type of moment? Let's put it, let's generalize it for our everyday walk, you know, being Christians. Have you had to make a decision where you had to decide if it's more beneficial for what you do to be more popular with people, or is this something that really is more pleasing to God and I can't worry about how it affects people. Okay, good. So we got people that can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to want to share an example? It doesn't necessarily have to be your own necessarily unless you want to share, but anybody want to give an example of that type of situation? Um, as a parent, that's there a good one. are those times and with a friend. Okay. There are times. Okay. I can see that. All right. Anyone else? In in business, sometimes Ooh, they want yeah. you to compromise your stand, and um, yeah. I've had to say no. That's good. That's good, Elder Michael. Yeah, in the, in the business world, yeah, that's that's real good. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I find it hard harder um, to address issues that you that you know are right that you have to give to people who are your family and friends than it is sometimes uh, from a pulpit stance because it's like you're actually confronting them face to face with an mm -hmm. issue whereas in with the pulpit sometimes it's kind of like generic you don't know who you know who it's hitting or who it's for and you're not aiming it at anyone it's just a message that God has given you but when you know he's sending you to a specific person and you have to say something specific to someone that's a heavier uh, thing to me because you know that your family and friends see you one way and you having to give them whatever the Lord has said or even if it's not like a direct thing that God told me to tell you kind of thing it's just you know right from wrong and you're coming off as a person who's better than them and you're not mm -hmm. yeah that's good. Very good. All right. 
Anyone else? Um, I would say like when you view something differently, like spiritually, or if you're talking to someone and like you see it from a you see what God was trying to do in that moment of a situation. And it's hard to like explain that to people who not not saying they're not on the same spiritual level, but they don't really want to understand because it's not the way the world do it. Or, you know, I wouldn't do it like that. You crazy. I would have did it this way. That was me. And it's right. and it's hard, you know, it's hard and sometimes you battle with that, like if you should even say it or and then you feel bad if you don't because you felt like you was chose to speak it, even if they don't understand. So Yeah. No, that's good. That, that's a good example too, Asia. Appreciate you sharing. Anybody else? Well, all of these examples, and we're going to talk about a few more, uh, is basically mirroring what Jesus is about to encounter. Does anybody know uh, what he's about to, this discussion? Because I'm going to reference a little bit of it, but we're not going to read the whole, the whole thing. Does anybody know what message was hard for them to hear that he was sharing? Or the genesis, of, the gist of it. This is the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood. And that just really creeped them out. <laughs> Very good. All right, so that's basically the message he was conveying to them, and they could not comprehend it for anything. And I'm go we're going to read a little bit of it, but think about it. You're hearing this man preach, and all of a sudden he says. If y'all want to go to heaven, if you want to be holy, you're gonna to have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. What would you what would you think? I think this dude is gonna count Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> but what what's the difference between what he's where he's what level he's speaking on and what they're hearing? Let me put it that way. He's speaking on spiritual terms and they're hearing on the natural level. Very good. That is the key. That's the difference. When you are really moving with the pace of God, when you're walking with him, when you're allowing him to give you his insights to life, I think I heard Asia, somebody saying it a minute ago, she said it's not that you're on a different level. It actually is. When you begin to grow, when you begin to evolve in your thinking to the level that God has aspired you to go to. You do think on another level. Now, that doesn't mean that you're on a level that's higher than somebody to look down upon them, but it means that you've taken the opportunity that's given to all of us, and God has grown your mindset and the way you look at things to such a degree and a level that it may not be the same as other people. Now, that's not for you to look down upon them as if they can't get there, but it's to show you, help you, for you to show them that there is another way to live life and that you can come up to another level if you put your eyes and your mind on the Lord. So that's the first thing I want us to recognize is that he was speaking in a spiritual way, but they were hearing with natural ears. And you'll hear ministers say a lot of times, I think I've even said it, it's in the Bible also, he who has an ear, let him hear what thus saith the Lord. I, I know y'all have heard that, right? Now, most often than not, everybody that's physically in the place has ears natural ears. But everybody that has natural ears can't hear what the Lord says because he's speaking at a frequency and on a level that requires the spiritual hearing to be turned on and sometimes turned on high so that you can hear what thus saith the Lord. Why do you think he does that? Why do you think he talks in a way that only certain people can hear him? If we base it on what he said, he said that the message for some have been hidden so that in seeing they won't see and hearing that they won't hear. It's not because he doesn't want them to. It's just because they're in a state of where they don't want to repent and they don't want to receive. So he has to hide even uh, those nuggets, those pearls of the kingdom um, that, are, that will only be reserved for his people. Okay. You, you're hitting on something I want to talk about. Uh, Marissa said, because he's trying to draw us closer to him, higher up. You, you're real good on it. Anybody else? Yeah, the God has masterfully crafted the details of his, his, uh, his story, if you will. And he's hidden it in plain sight. That's the way I look at it. 
Um, and he's 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 hitting it, hitting it to where everybody necessarily can't grasp it. But then when you seek, when you search, when you aspire to, it's like opening up a gift. Your mind begins to open up. Have anybody experienced this? Your mind begins to expand. Your awareness become, and, and your eyes are opened. And you start looking at things that may have happened in your life and that has been spoken to you and over you in now a spiritual way. Is any, first of all, has anybody experienced what I'm describing? Yeah. Where, you know, that's not coincidental. And it's, it happens that way because God can't be explained. He's revealed. And he's only revealed to a heart and a mind that's ready to receive. Mm -hmm. And it's partly a protective mechanism for us and for him. And it's also a rewarding system because you, the Bible says literally he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Meaning as you seek, you find and you find new rewards that are only uncovered as you display your commitment. That's what he's looking for. Your commitment and your willingness to not only just get intel, but to receive instructions on what to do with it. Because think about it. If you have a secret or formula to something, if you're smart, you'd want to protect it from somebody who would do harm with it. But you want to make sure that the person that you give that to is worthy of handling that information in such a way that they'll know what to do with it when they have it. Am I, am I making sense? Uh, questions or yes. comments? Yeah, the, um, uh, one of his parables, didn't he touch on that about uh, the the one, he said the kingdom of heaven is uh, like a man who findeth a treasure in a field or something and he uh, buries it, but then he goes out and sells all that he has so that he can buy buy that field. Is is that commitment? Is that um, pursuit of something that is so good or that you find so valuable that right. you're willing to abandon everything else? And That's so God it. is looking for those pursuers. Yes, and when you like she's saying, when you understand the value of it, which you really won't unless you really pursue it. But once you discover the value of it, you treasure it to such a degree that whatever you had or could have that would be in its place is no longer comparable in value to what you gained through this process. So now you can be that rich man and say, I can give up the riches of the world because what I gained in Christ is far greater. You can't do that with a natural mind, a mind that has not pressed in to the awareness to get to that level which you comprehend that, yeah, even if I give up physically what I have, if I need it again, he can give it right back. And But more importantly, what I gain outside of that far outweighs that material worth that I thought I had. It, it is. It's a very... Very gratifying game. Renita said, "I experienced it when I was." She, she said, "When she she experienced it when she was caring for her mom." And Mother Massey said, "The more intimate you become with Christ, the more He reveals to you." And she said, "It's so gratifying," which it is. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Would it would it come to where the seeking of God is more of the bigger treasure, like where? If you say like pirates, like they would do everything, risking their lives to go find this particular treasure. That's almost the same way as opening up yourself to God because yeah. there is no bigger treasure than seeking him and yes. knowing him personally. That's right. Good, Mary. There, there, there comes a point in the chase or in the search where... And it usually happens after you get a little touch or a taste of what you actually can get access to, which is why the scripture, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, is so powerful to me. But when you get a little taste of something that is so good, then you will stop at nothing to get more of it. It's the same psychology that an addict experiences, but this means now you're addicted to the presence of Christ. You're addicted to the, the blessings of God and the character of God. And when you're addicted to something, you stop at nothing to get more of what you're addicted to. So, yes, it gets to a place that as you see God and you get closer to him, there ought to be a place where life is not enjoyable or manageable without him. I don't know if y'all have reached that place, but I know I have. 
my life don't fit and don't work right if I don't spend time with God. I can tell, I can feel, I can literally feel when I've allowed the busyness of life, when I've allowed responsibilities or, or tasks and all of these things or people's opinions, all that stuff to get in the way of what my lifeline is. And hopefully y'all can say that too because you ought to reach that type of place where God is so ingrained in you in some way that you can feel the distance when it's there. And then when you feel that distance, you do what you have to do to get close again. <laughs> Am I making sense? I, okay, I see a few amens right there. Yes. So that that's a sure sign that you've grown and that you're on this path that we're talking about here tonight. Any questions or comments about that before I, I get into this text? That's even where you will cut off certain people out of your lives that's been a sure. part of your life all along. And it doesn't matter who they are, family, friends, whatever. You feel like that they're interfering with your closer walk with Christ. You will cut them off quick, fast, and in a hurry and will not care. Girl, you're talking right. This mm -hmm. is when Jesus was talking to him. He said, if you don't give up your family, your wife, mama, daddy, whoever for me, you ain't ready yet. He's right. It's not that you disrespecting people, but you do reach a place where, going back to what Asia said earlier, where if somebody is not on the level that you are you are aspiring to or that God is calling you to, you don't have time for that at that moment. You have to guard what's needed for you to be engaged in this process. And mm -hmm. sometimes those ties you have to let go of are seasonal. Sometimes they're permanent. But God will give you the wisdom to know which. But yes, you have to literally lay aside the weight that so Amen. easily besets us as the way the scripture says it. Amen. Whatever is weighing you down, people, stuff, circumstances, anything, whatever is in the way and weighing you down, there comes a point in time where you have to strip off that weight so that you can then be free enough to be connected with God. And then, like I said, he gives you then the wisdom, the understanding, and the insight to know if this is something you can safely pick up again or if it's something you're done with. And most often than not, it's something you're done with, unless that thing comes up to the level that you've learned and grown to. All right, that's a good point. Uh, let me get these comments, and I'll take any others if we have some. Uh, Ramesha said, I learned that it didn't take a day for me to get the distance from him that I got, and I'm learning that it's taken more than a day to get it back. That's so true. It, it's it's a, it's it doesn't take long to get away. The, the enemy is so crafty. It's subtle. It's subtle how it happens, but it does take a intention. I'll say it that way to get back. But when your intention is set towards Christ, it gets easier as you go. I can say that. It gets easier as you go. It's difficult in the beginning when you first make that switch or that you know, you decide you want to do it and do it right. You That's when the enemy is fighting tooth and nail because it's that decision-making time. But then when you've decided, that's why old folks say, I got a made-up mind. When you finally get a made-up mind, that's when it starts getting easier because you've now set forth in motion the process of I'm not turning back, so now it gets easier. But you're right. It's subtle initially. But it does take intention to get it back. Good point. Uh, Asia said you will feel out of place when you force yourself to stay when you were supposed to walk away from it in this season. She's right. If you're trying to force yourself to stay in a season that God is calling you away from, a relationship he's calling you out of, a job he's no longer intending for you to be upon, any of these things, even a church or even a family situation, if you're trying to force yourself to stay in a place God is no longer there, it's a miserable feeling. Can anybody, has anybody experienced that? I know I have. Amen. It is a miserable feeling. Amen. So uh, you have to, you have to know uh, his voice so that you can let him carry you through each season, each phase, so that you're moving with him. Talking about that pace setting again. You're moving with him and at his pace. And you're not trying to take a break and stand and build a tent or build a temple where he intended for you to build a tent. A temple is a permanent structure. A tent is a temporary dwelling. So sometimes you got to take a tent and hang out for a minute. But he wants you to keep moving until it's time to build and settle where he wants you to be. All right, good, good uh, comment, Asia. Any questions or comments on any of these? 
All right, let me catch Mother Massey here. She said, God becomes a thirst for your soul. Amen. You'll start to crave this water. It becomes an amazing addiction. Yes, it does. I love, I think I've mentioned this before, I love that dialogue and that discussion between Jesus and the woman at the well. I think it's John the 11th chapter, I believe. But I love that dialogue because it speaks it speaks about the natural thirst, and then it to goes into that, 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 that soul thirst. And he's correlating the difference between the two, and then you also get to see what happens when you start satisfying what really matters. It's a beautiful thing. It is really a beautiful thing, and that's what she's talking about here. All right, good stuff. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. I do have a question. Um, okay. I don't know how to ask it, but what if you feel like you're going through the cycles of being close to him, then feeling the distance, being close to him, then feeling the distance? What does that, I guess, say signify or um, say? I mean, is it something that you may not be hearing him talk about that you continue to get into a distant mode? Or it is truly just the business of life that has now taken over. It, it it's <clears throat> it's really I like that question. It's really dependent upon the situation. You have to honestly, and this is the key word, you have to honestly ask yourself what's causing the distance. Um, if it's more often than not situational then you haven't yet mastered the balance that's needed for you to stay connected to the degree that you may want to. If you are focused in and you're building the right parameters and you're safely trying to live within those and you still kind of just get thrown off base, that's just you learning how to live life but stay connected because that's what you have to learn at some point. We can't stop living life. We can't stop going to work. We can't stop uh, being around craziness, we can't stop being around uh, all the stuff that's going on in the world. But we can learn how to live in our faith zone in the midst of a chaotic and crazy world. And that's what the well, that's what the end goal ought to become is where you're no longer those periods are not as lengthy, they're not as long, and they're not as detrimental. And then you begin to get strength to the degree to where you can be knocked off the same way you used to, but instead of it taking you two months, it only takes you a week to get back. You see what I'm saying? So, and, and eventually, they hit you, don't even really phase you anymore. So it just it just really depends on what the cause is. But once you identify the cause, then you have to make sure that you're doing your part to make sure that those causes aren't representing more of your time than they ought to. Does that does that help answer your question? Yes, sir, it does. And the reason why I was asking is because I know I felt a shift and had a desire to even go further. But at times I feel so far away. Seem like the distance okay. away. And okay. I, I honestly be trying to figure out what it is, like you say you gotta figure it out. And I honestly figure out I mean I honestly don't know. Well, what it sounds like you're describing, and I see Ramisha got a comment. I'm going to read hers in a second. It sounds like you're describing the part where he's stripping you of your feelings because <laughs> it's like you're wanting to feel a certain way to determine where you are, and that's not going to always be the case either. Okay. You've got to <laughs> – that, that's just faith exercise is all that is. Uh, you cannot – he's not – when he's, when God calls you to the levels that he intends for you to live in this faith walk, you cannot depend on your feelings. If that's your compass, if that's your barometer, it's still faulty and it's still going to get you in trouble. So he has to strip you of that dependence to such a degree to where that doesn't determine the level you're on. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So there will be seasons where you're deep and you're in the right place and you don't feel like it. But that don't mean you're not there. So when I don't feel like it, I still am I still going to do what I know I'm supposed to do or am I going to sit idle and plain and be frustrated until I feel a certain way again? Can't be feelings based. It's got to be you knowing. One second, you got to be you knowing 
and then you moving in the direction that you know and that you being taught. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead, Mom, and I, I need to get these other comments. I'm just here. gonna ask a question in that question. Do you think that that it's a mind battle sometimes that mm -hmm. Satan may play up on your mind to make you think you're not where you need to be? And in actuality, well, you are. He's just trying to make you think you're not. Yes and no. I, I'm going to say it this way. Yeah, I think he, he it is that. But that's why you can't afford to let your feelings be your base because he can manipulate that. Yeah. But when you really allow yourself to be led only by faith, he can't manipulate you then. So he can use that, but it's not always him causing that to happen. Yeah, okay. So so it, it can happen that way, but a lot of times this is God allowing you to experience it to determine what you're going to do. Are you going to be feeling based and stay at this level where he can manipulate, where he can get at you, where he can confuse your mind? Or are you going to trust what I've told you and put your faith above your feelings and now yeah. you're growing to a place he can't get to you? Okay, so, yeah. So, so that's good. That makes sense, uh, everybody else, and Renata especially. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. And it, um, <laughs> it's just curious because at first I thought it was the busyness of the things I had going on all at once and feeling like I'm far away. And now that I wasn't, it still feel like I'm distanced, right? And I know right. that I have no question um, that I know that a shift happened in November and I felt the closeness, the deepness and all the stuff and even seeing things that he had opened up more with my spiritual eyes, even though he was blessing me with have spiritual, have natural feeling. But now I'm like this, this, I, and I call it feeling and it might not really be in the, and then again, it probably is. I still have that that feeling of still feeling like I'm distant or I'm missing something. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out and there it is. <laughs> you got it. Well, I think you got what you need and he's trying to take you to another level. Yeah. And I'm, I'm reading a little bit what Ramisha said. It's funny. She said, basically, it sounds like she's saying the same thing I just shared. She said, it could also be a faith. She said, I've learned that when I feel like I'm in different seasons where I sense him and then I don't and, and in them, I'm learning to truly walk by faith. He hasn't distanced himself. He's just making sure our faith isn't based on feelings. <laughs> we didn't even <laughs> talk about it. It's the same thing. So that's confirmation. Yeah. And in, uh, it's also confirmation you said that because the words and that have been ringing in my head lately is keep the faith. So mm. it's just tying yeah. it all around. So, yeah. yeah. I it the other day yeah. and it keep coming up today. And so, yeah. Yeah, Pretty feelings sure. is, is a hidden detour to our, our faith zone if we're not careful. We're so used to feeling feelings, and you're not going to ever stop feeling feelings, but you got to learn how to put your feelings under your faith and not let that be the determining factor on how you respond. And that's what you gain when you see God and get the wisdom and the strategies that he gives. It teaches you how to do that. So that's a good point. All right, Sister Vanita said, when she when I, when you see the word God does in a love in a love one, I'm sure that's what that means. Speaking of my mom and the overwhelming of a caregiver through her testimony and faith, her prayers caused me to thirst more to go deep in my faith. Amen. And mm -hmm. now she says, I'm encouraged to tell others. Thank you for sharing that, Vanita. Amen. Yeah. If, and, and again, if you all know her, most of you knew her mother, you knew that was faith was all in that woman. She just exuded faith. Yes, <laughs> so she was one of those that don't turn it on when she come into church. She lived it no matter what she went through. And so Benita saying being her caregiver and seeing that day in and day out encouraged her and built her up to a, a certain degree. Don't mean she didn't have faith before, but I'm sure it fortified her faith in a new way that now she not only has a new way to look at life's challenges as she goes, but she does a great job. Y'all see her post sometimes. She gives these inspirational quotes and give these motivational things. She was doing it then, but I'm sure she's doing it even now from a different perspective because now she's beginning to walk out the faith that was demonstrated in front of her. That's a powerful testimony. Thank you for sharing that. And that's what we do. We never know who's watching us. I'm learning that more and more. You never know who's watching you and who's gaining strength by what you're doing. You may feel like you're not doing anything right. You're coming up short. I'm not. 
I'm circling and doing all this stuff. But just you showing up and still trusting the Lord, just you showing up and committing yourself, that commitment word is, is real dominant here tonight. You committing to the process. You committing to showing up on calls after you've been in the hospital. You committing to showing up and, and doing what's needed even though you had to bury somebody. All these different things, you never know who you are inspiring by your growth and your faith walk. You don't do it for those reasons, but when you do it right, it helps you. It's a blessing to you, and it ends up being a blessing to somebody else. And that's part of our calling as we live out our life story. We're supposed to do what we do, do it the best we can all the time, and leave the results to God on how he uses it to inspire other people. And that can be anything. It can be an uh, inspirational quote. It can be a smile. It can be your, your gifts, your sports talents, your business savvy, your whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is, whatever your calling is. Learn how to use it the way God intends, and you can bless a lot of people and be blessed in the process. All right. Uh, Ruby said, your mom gave you a great foundation to build upon. Amen. Yes, ma'am. She did. It's funny, when Renita, when she called me that morning when, when Mother Jefferson passed, I told her then, I said, I don't know if she remembers it, I told her, well, she showed us how to do it. She showed, you know, we were encouraging each other, and I told her she showed us how to do it, how to live it by faith, and how to walk in this season. So now we have the foundation to build upon that those who walked it and lived it have given us, and that's priceless. That's priceless. That's a foundation that will last forever. That's Psalm 127. So unless the Lord builds a house, unless he lays the foundation that's built upon faith and fortified by the the walk of faith, uh, it, it, it doesn't do anything. But when it's done that way, it lasts, and it lasts through everything and, and for all time. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, so going back to this, let me summarize what Jesus is saying, and then I want you to turn in your Bibles. He's talking about this, I am the bread of life and all this stuff. And I want you to turn, let's look at uh, verses... Let's start at verse 48. Let's look in, at this text. J John, the sixth chapter, turn over to verse 48. Um, and let's start reading a little bit there. Um, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread of he bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. All right, so that's the word he gave. That's the gist of the message he was preaching on a spiritual level to them. Now let's look at how they received it. Go ahead, Mom, read a little bit more. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They All right, let me stop right there. <laughs> you understand, he preached, he preached a good message, the right message, what's needed for them to gain eternal life, to get the blessings of God. But their natural minds caused them to go into conflict where they end up arguing against each other. That's that's it's the same as if I'm in church on Blackburn Chapel preaching a message God gave us, but natural minds are receiving it in a way that's going to turn them against each other in the sanctuary. That's exactly what this is what's happening here. That's how far off their minds were from being able to receive the blessing that would come to them if they heard it on the spiritual level. Do y'all see that? I'm trying to make it clear to what's going on here. Yeah. All right, let's let's read a little bit more. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drink my blood remains in me, and I in him. 
I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. All right. He said, uh, before you... Go well, he said it in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, which is where, the, where their church was. Let me, let me give you this next context before she read the next part. He's literally giving them the blueprint, the recipe to living a blessed life and experiencing the blessings that come from God. But this is what they do when they hear what could be the thing that gives them the opportunity at their greatest level of blessing. Watch how they respond. Go ahead. Let's read. Start at verse 60. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing and the wor very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life but some of you do not believe me for Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe and he knew who would bet betray him then he said that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the father gives them to me all right At before she go before she go further I hope you all are getting what's going on here, but I can't help from a from a from a pastor standpoint. This pains me. It saddens me so much because these are his disciples. Mm -hmm. These are the people who had a front row seat to learning and discovering who he was and what he was about. But they were so used to thinking with a natural mind, they were on the cusp. Of missing out on their greatest level of blessings. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. But it also shows the great compassion of our God and the fact that He knew they would have this struggle, but He did not call. He didn't. He didn't change His mind about calling them disciples. He didn't change His mind about letting them follow Him. He didn't change His mind about using them to help them become what He intended for them to be in the first place. He let them fail their way through it and lovingly guided them to the opportunity to experience it. Same as he does for us. But it does, you finna find out though, not everybody benefited from it. Uh, I'm going to get the comments in a minute. I want to finish this thought because I want you to put it all together. And, and it, it saddens me because, well, let's read the next part and I'll tell you what, what, what's potentially saddening me. Let's read, start at verse 66. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe, and we know you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, I chose the twelve of you, but one is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve who would later betray him. All right. So even though he had a lot of people that was in his corner, after standing and doing what he knew the Lord wanted him to do, a lot of them, most of them left. And that's how he ended up with just the twelve. That's, a, that, that's, that's something to me. Mm -hmm. But... He was able to take that 12 and change the whole world. Well, they actually 11 because you see what, what he said about one of them. But, but it teaches us several things. One, God don't need everybody to do great things. Two, it's an individual decision. You can be around it all your life and still miss out on the blessings that are intended for you if you're always allowing your carnality and your natural mind to be your source and your guide. And then three, 
he already knows what he has invested in you. And sometimes this describes what we were talking about a minute ago. He demonstrates how he has to separate and not allow everybody to partake of because everybody's not able to handle what it requires. Do y'all see those things? He just showed us what we were talking about a minute ago. Some people are with you for a season, but mm -hmm. at some point when you get ready to go to another level, you can't take everybody with you. Yeah. But it don't mean you stay, can't still get done what needs to be done. And he did it and he did it well. Do y'all see all those things? Uh, yes. I'm opening it up for questions and comments. Let me catch Ramesha's first. She said on one level he's saying accept and receive my sacrifice. On another level he's saying partake in my obedience, which was the flesh, and partake in my sacrifice, which is the blood. Amen. Amen. And then Elder Michael said you can't take everybody with you. Well said, pal. Yeah, you can't. You, you, this, is, this is it in print. When you get ready to do the deep things of God, everybody can't go with you. Everybody's not qualified to go with you. But he just showed you, you don't need everybody to go with you to get done what you've been called to do. Okay, and Mother Massey said that's what's happening today. Our faith becomes faint with watching worldly disasters. That's why he said he, he with little faith. It is, but that's why I'm always encouraging you all, even though the world as a whole may not be on this faith walk, it does not take away from those of us that are. And if you stay on that faith walk, you don't have to be deterred by all the stuff that's going on in the world. You don't have to be completely affected by it. Yeah, you're around it, but it does not determine what your destiny is already sealed with. But if you lose sight, then you'll you'll be you're on this narrow road, this little this little path. He told us in the Bible there's a narrow road, it was a small road. But you're on this road, but if you see everybody going in the other direction, then you may be tempted to leave this road and this path you've been placed on and go do what everybody else is doing. And that's where you now become a victim of what everybody else is going to be victimized of and by. But this road is the calling that he's called us upon, and he's promised protection. He's promised blessings. He's promised himself to those who faithfully walk this path. And that's the path I want you all to walk. All right, questions, comments? Did that make sense to you? Of 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 talk the the thought we initially came upon is that Jesus was not he didn't allow crowds, influence, people's opinions to dictate what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. Because he spent time alone with the Lord and got instructions from God and built his life on those instructions, he was able to have his greatest impact from gaining strength with that time alone and then get the right perspective so that when people start walking away and they don't accept you, you realize it's not even you they're not accepting. It's the Christ and the God that's in you. And that helps you from when you are speaking from experience. When you have to give a hard message or have to get make a stand and you know it's initially not well received, it gives you the freedom to leave the results to God because you know you're being obedient to him. And I've seen him turn it around. I've seen him make good on his promise. I've seen him do some amazing things that would not have happened if a person had not been obedient and stood and stayed in the place of obedience when it was inconvenient and not ideal. Stand on his promise. That's what Anita wrote. Amen. Uh, let's see here. Asia said, and you have to be prepared for that season of walking away. And it's going to seem hard, but trust me, trust he has prepared you for it. Amen. I'm sure I could get a few amens to this. He's never called you away from something that he didn't have something better for you in store. I hope, has anybody seen that, experienced that? Amen. Sometimes we're so used to what we have in front of us and we've built our life thinking it was required to have, but a lot of times you have to let go of this to get your better that. That's coming. Amen. You have to let go in order to receive. Amen. You can't receive nothing with a closed hand. That's what I was taught. You want to receive something, you got to open up and let go of whatever was here so that you can receive what's coming next. All right. Good stuff. All right. We got about five minutes here. Let, let's see what I got here. Uh, um, I think I can finish out this. Let's try to finish out a little bit more of this section here. So let's, type, let's start where it says that type of behavior. 
and, and we're gonna correlate what we just read it with what's going on in the tech, in the document here. That type of behavior, that type of behavior is foreign to American Christians. Our churches often cater to crowds. We love the instant validation from a packed auditorium on Sunday morning. But Jesus didn't care about Facebook likes or packed auditoriums. Jesus knew you couldn't point a crowd to God if you needed their approval. Mm. You can't point people. You can't point people to Jesus if you need their approval. Mm. American Christians could learn something from Jesus. Are we attracting crowds to fill our self-seeking desire for quick validation? On a personal level, are you living the life you proclaim? You can't preach the difficult message of self-denial if you attract people on the basis of self-interest. <laughs> you can't embrace the scandalous, radical life of Jesus if you need the approval of others. And Jesus knew this. That's why he disengaged from the crowds. He wanted to be driven by God's desires, not the crowd's demands. Amen. That's powerful stuff there, y'all. I hope, hope we got that. Um, and this is so true. This type of commitment that's their word again it's foreign to i like the fact that it says american christians a lot of people are doing things in the name of christ but not doing it the way of christ <laughs> god they just deposited that they're doing it in the name of christ but not doing it in the way of christ and the way he did it and he didn't care anything about a lot of the the numbers as a matter of fact it's kind of funny to me that where we used to put so much emphasis on a church being successful if it was large in number where he shut down the churches and now in a lot of ways the churches are greater than they were before that's the, that's how God operates man I could tell you some things about what's been going on in the spirit but he has shown us he doesn't put emphasis on the stuff that's important to us if we're paying attention and he's not caught up in the likes and followers and all of that on for approval sake he wants to know how much impact are you having and I like the fact that it said you can't preach a difficult message about self-denial if you if you're dependent upon what people's opinion about it is all right all right I'm gonna stop there any questions or comments about that did that did that did that make did that make sense to you on what Jesus did versus what's going on in the world now. Can y'all see the difference? Yeah, it, it did. And I, I, I'm with you on this, that American, the American Christian, because it's like we are like some of the most Christian, non-persecuted, comfortable Christians there are in life. And yet, you know, we, for some reason, find it the hardest to deliver a message. And it's probably because of that. We've been so accustomed to our comfortability and appeasing crowds that it's hard to really get a an evangelistic ministry out there into the world because we're comfortable and we don't yeah. like to be persecuted. Yeah, um, I kept hearing that word evangelism, you know, during the General Assemblies and Huntsville Presbyteries and those things. The mindset wants to do evangelism, but we want to do it while we're comfortable, and they don't go together. Uh, you have to get outside of what you're comfortable with and what you're used to to evangelize in a way that's really going to have the impact that's needed. And that's that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're trying to do spiritual things, but we're trying to do it in a worldly way a worldly way and it's and that's where we're having our biggest problems uh as you said i seen somebody say we follow the world and doesn't let the world follow us that's the sad reality the church as a whole now we're not talking about everybody there is a remnant that's trying and learning and half of us is represented here tonight we're trying to learn it the right way but the church as a whole you're right that's what the world sees they don't see a difference between the church and the world so the mind says, why should I commit, there's that word again, commit to the church and the ways of God if the church is doing what I'm doing? If I see them in the clubs when I go, what difference does it make? If I see them all on Facebook and TikTok showing everything they got just like I'm doing, what's the difference? So we have to, we have to make some decisions. You know, it doesn't mean you can't, 
enjoy certain things in life, but you got to make a decision, y'all. Y'all got to y'all got to understand this world. Man, this stuff is going on. This stuff is real. And like Jesus was teaching in the temple, he's giving answers and prescriptions on what to do and how to do it and 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 the thing about it the teaching he's providing and the teaching he's trying to give us as ministers is trying to do it, it still promises blessings. It still will lead to blessings in the midst of all that don't look like blessings. But you're not going to get the blessings of God and the blessing of having God if you're trying to do everything the world's way. It's just not going to happen that way. So there's got to be a separation and a difference, and that choice belongs to us. Okay? I, I can't can't go there because I'm so passionate about that because I see the I see the extremes I can see the differences and I'm encouraged and blessed by the small group that's getting it and that's learning and that's growing but I'm pained when I see the vast majority of the people that's missing out it's painful to watch okay all right any final questions or comments I say we because we are one body all right are we learning something? Are is it? You feel like y'all, this is helping you? Yes, mm -hmm. it's definitely helping me because um, I know I put a lot on my plate and have to learn to, you know, move at his pace, even with his pace in my spiritual walk. Um, not try to get to a quick destination in him when he knows that I'm not ready to get to that point. So it's yeah. helping me both ways. Yes. The wisdom of God is a treasure worth having. And you won't get wisdom if you're always moving too fast to hear it. Uh, the Bible says wisdom has built our house. When you allow wisdom to enter into your life by taking time to sit with the Lord and allowing him to minister to you, uh, you have something that's really valuable that you will not find anywhere else. But the world is too busy to receive the wisdom of God. And that's why we just do stuff. We're just doing stuff. People just doing stuff. Because there is no wisdom guiding their life. But God is yet still willing and able. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let them ask. And he said, I will give liberally I without reproach. He's not withholding it. He's reserving it. Come on, y'all, hear me. He's reserving it for those that really want it and that's demonstrating they want it by how they're trying to live their life. He said, I will give it to you. I got it. It's available. But it's set aside in reservation <laughs> for those that's willing to come after it. I got to quit. I'm done. All right. Anything else? Anything else? Well, thank y'all. Thank y'all for your time, your input. Welcome back again. I actually y'all surprised me. I didn't ex I didn't expect a, a large number of people here tonight because I thought some people would have forgotten. But I, I heard some people showed up uh, a couple weeks ago or something and missed us. I, I hate that, but I'm proud that y'all showed up. Uh, that was me and Elder Michael, and I saw <laughs> I saw our Sister Jefferson, but she logged back out. <laughs> But y'all was ready and willing, and the Lord was able, so he still blessed you nonetheless for showing up, so that's good. Uh, look like I missed a few YouTube comments. I'm sorry about that. They were amening from Misha, and Deacon still said, Renata, empty your plate. He's telling you to empty your plate. <laughs> All right, good stuff, good stuff. All right. All right, so we got everything covered. Any final, um, and Andretta said, yes, yeah, she was there, okay. You see, showed up too. <laughs> well, y'all gonna get a special blessing for showing up. So, <laughs> good deal. All right. Well, if there is nothing else, do we have any prayer requests or praise reports before we get ready to dismiss? Pastor. Yes, sir. Um, we need to put Virginia Washington on our prayer list. She she lost her her nephew, uh, and uh, we we need to put her on a prayer list. But we can do that. We can definitely do that. Thank you for that, sir. All right. Anyone else? Um. Yeah. For me, uh, I'm struggling with uh, some things at work at this moment. Coming back, I know it's interesting, but just pray for um, clarity, guidance, and just 
maintaining my faith on whatever the outcome may be. Amen. So God can do that and then some. So we got you. Anybody else? I know mine may seem kind of strange, but um, uh, Khadija and TD they both lost their favorite pets to where um, they are taking it kind of hard. So if they, you know, yeah. we could just pray for them to get the strength. I mean, even though they were pets, they were still their family. So yeah. they're taking that kind of hard right now. All right. We got you covered, sweetheart. Nothing wrong with that. Anybody else? And I see the ones in the co in the comments. I'll touch on those after. Uh, let's see. I got Willie May. I got her. Uh, we can still say pray for him to return home safely. Okay. Sound like he's getting close to coming home. We'll definitely pray your safety and pray for you while you're there. Andretta's asking for prayers for her son, Mason. She's dropping him off at college Friday. We know what that's like, so we will definitely lift you up even more so than him. We're going to cover him as well. But we know what that's like when you drop your baby off for the first time. Got you covered. We will continue to pray for the Graham family. Uh, they did lay their mother to rest today, and, and they did it with grace and did a wonderful job. But let's continue to pray for them as they now start this new phase and this new transition for them. And uh, we we can all relate to that as well. And Elder Hall, we got it. Mother Sheridan as well. Okay. Well, we know the faithfulness of our God that he hears and answers prayers. You know, somebody said a minute ago, it's strange. Yeah, what's strange to us is not foreign and strange to God. He wants us to trust him enough to bring all of our cares and concerns to him. And I know y'all agree like I do that he's faithful to hear any sincere heart that cries out to him. So that's why we pray like we do. And we have testimonies upon testimonies of us putting our faith in the Lord and he making good on that. And he's honoring our faith. Amen. Amen. Uh, praying for the kids returning to school. Yes, definitely. So let's pray. God, we honor you tonight for the great God that you are. And that you always take time, no matter how busy you are. You've shown us and demonstrated you take time out for us. And you're always willing to hear us when we cry out to you. So, Lord, teach us how to continue to structure our lives by the power of your word and how to set, how to move at the pace that you've set for us and to frame our lives and to build our minds and our hearts by the blueprints that you've given us that promises your hand of blessing and your eternal presence always. Thank you for these people, Lord God, that have placed their faith and their trust fully in you, and they're doing the work to be committed, to commit to the process of doing what's needed for them to continue to grow and evolve and become all that you've called them to be. We don't. We realize that we still have challenges. We don't sit here on this call in these classes and act like we won't still have things we have to deal with. Yes. But, but God, we celebrate the fact that when they show up and we deal with them, we can still do it from a victorious place because you're teaching us how to win no matter what comes our way. And we thank you for that. We thank you for victory in spite of and, oh, and the ability to overcome all that comes our way. Lord, be with all the prayer requests that have been mentioned tonight from traveling to job situations to new beginnings with our children and with them going back into their schools to even new beginnings with our children as they go into a new phase of their journey in life, God. You are our constant in all these situations, God. You're a healer. You're a sustainer. You're a keeper. You're a provider. You're all these and so much more for us. So we are fully confident to place all these different things and cares in your hands, Lord God and knowing that you will provide all of our needs. Thank you in advance for what you will do, what you've done. Bless all that have been mentioned name by name. And Lord God, be with us as we move forward from this day, but never from your eternal presence. God, we thank you always, and thank you for this time allowing us to have it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Y'all be blessed. Enjoy the rest of your week. Be safe. And we will see you soon. Take care. Amen.